<coughs> well, it is a real joy to, to invite you, David, to this ancient pulpit. <laughs> it's a very powerful place. There have been some amazing preachers here, not in recent years, though, um, but in the past. And you're going to talk to us about how it all began, I believe, here in Norwich with um, Robert Brown. But um, D- David, like most of us, has a few grey hairs, a <laughs> great deal of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> um, I understand um, became a Christian at quite an early age of 16 and has had quite an amazing career as a preacher. Uh, you preached on both sides of the Atlantic, I believe. And um, if you go to his website, you'll never come away from it. There's, a, there's just so much information there. I, I just found it so, so enriching. There are talks, and I've written a few books, but how David has written so many, I just do not know. It's more than 30, isn't it, David? Yeah, it's quite amazing. And, and they're not pamphlets, they're proper books. They're absolutely amazing. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to have, have you with us this evening. Uh, David, as well as being a preacher, um, as he's also very much into doing watercolouring. Pity you didn't bring your colours with you, so next time we'll have an exhibition here, perhaps. But um, it's lovely to welcome you, and I'm going to shut up because... We all came to hear you. Before I start, let me just explain. There'll be things in this paper. That, um, I prepared this uh, thinking there might be people here who uh, were strangers to me. And uh, I thought we might have uh, a wider audience. But I'm still going to deliver the paper because if I start messing it about, it will go all over the place. So <laughs> it might go all over the place anyway. My uh, title tonight was uh, Robert Brown, with an E, uh, Separatist and Norwich. Uh, But I'm going to change the title straight away, and I'm going to call it Robert Brown, uh, Thinking the Unthinkable. And I can actually change it again and say Robert Brown, Doing the Undoable. Robert Brown, who was then in his early thirties, lodged in the city of Norwich for a few months during the years 1580 to 1581. He was soon arrested and jailed, after which in 1582 he emigrated to Middleburg in the Low Countries, where he published three books. Such are the salient facts about my subject this evening. Not much, is it? End of story. (laughs) End of paper. Far from it. In 1583, remember the dates, he was here for a few months, 1580 uh, to 1581. And then he went to Middleburg in 1582. In 1583, Elias Thacker and John Coppin were hanged at Bury St. Edmunds, hanged with Brown's books tied around their necks. Their crime, they had read and led others to read Brown's writings. 
in 1584, remember yet again the dates, in 1584, within two or three years, seven Norfolk clergymen were writing to the authorities asking for help, complaining that they were having great difficulty in keeping the people from going over to the Brownists. At the opening of the 17th century, that is, within 20 years, William Shakespeare published his Twelfth Night. And in Twelfth Night, Sir Andrew Aguecheek is advised that if he win wants to win the lady, he'll have to change his tactics. Either he'll have to come out into the open and uh, speak openly to the lady, or else he'll have to scheme his way into her affection. And Sir Andrew reports, uh, retorts, he's clear, I have no heart for scheming, and this is how he puts it, I'd have leaf as be, I'd just as much be, I'd rather be, a brownist as a politician. He's dismissing his scheming by the illustration, the illusion of the brownist. A politician, you see, for Sir Andrew was the lowest of the low. And he classed the Brownists with them, the followers of Robert Brown. In the United States of America, Brown has the reputation of being the father of the 1620 pilgrims and the grandfather of the nation. Speaking for myself, I can see how a man like Oliver Cromwell, a man of whom I cannot speak too highly, can be thought of as a spiritual great-grandchild of Robert Brown. These facts speak volumes. Whoever Robert Brown was, and whatever he did, it's clear that by any standard, he was a man to be reckoned with. Clearly, he had a tremendous influence, a widespread influence, in his day and in a very short time. Take the first incident. Within a year of the publication of his books, two men were hanged for reading them and for leading and encouraging others to do the same and adopt his teaching. They were hanged with Brown's books straddled around their necks. Now, you've heard, I've written a few books myself, but none of my works has had the like effect. And in such a short time. And I've got the internet. We're talking here about the 16th century. We're talking uh, the late 16th century. The mass distribution, I mean, it must have been impossible, but men hanged within a few months for reading this man's books. I say he must have been a man to be written with. Then again, if four Anglican ministers have to write to the authorities and say, we can't stop the people following this man. Well, I've done a fair bit of talking in my time, but the influence I've had has been precious little. This man was having them in droves. He must have been a handful. <laughs> Prove him more than a handful. And in 20 years, Shakespeare can use him on a national scale, uh, uh, make an allusion to him, and everybody gets the joke. I mean, if you came to Bedford and said about the old meeting house in um, William Bridges meeting house in uh, Norris, they would, they'd have gone out. But this man's reputation is national. Within another 20 years, his reputation is international. America. And as I say, when you remember the communication difficulties and all the rest of that time, I mean, he must have been dynamite. Now, I want to begin with an apology. Uh, getting my defense in first, I have to confess that since I prefer to preach, and since I prefer to preach extempore, I'm no good at reading papers. I'll try and stick to it because I know what happens if I don't. I get lost. But in mitigation, let me remind you of the 
or say excellent dictum. I would dictum. I wonder if you think it is excellent. If a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Do you know who said that? Well, who does it sound like? Come on, you know, Rachel. You would think. Come on. Well, it sounds like Oscar Wilde, doesn't it? That's just the sort of thing he'd say. It's a joke. No, it's not. It was said by G.K. Chesterton. And he was dead serious. What he was saying was, well, let me translate it into my own. Tonight, the speaker may be no good. His paper may not be up to much. But the man he is talking about and what he did is well worth considering. It may be done badly, but don't get put off. Think about what he stood for. On an even more serious note, see, it, it doesn't really apply now, but I will say it. Um, I, I offer an apology. Now, I don't mean I'm sorry, uh, but I mean it in a technical sense. You see, I, I, if the place has been packed, I would say, well, I'll say it anyway, um, you may be here on false pretenses. You see, I don't come from academe. I'm not a professional scholar. I mean, that's obvious already. But I, I, I haven't got the brains for it. I haven't got the grace matter, you see. But I, more even important, I haven't got the disposition for it. You see, in the academe, uh, as I understand it anyway, uh, the, the man there has to be disinterested. He, he has to be clinical. He has to get to the facts. You see, but I'm partisan, you see. <laughs> I admire this man. I respect him. He speaks to me, though he's dead. He challenges me. He reproves me. He sets me an example I want to emulate. I was going to say, and I will say it, since I don't come from the world of academe, I fully expected people to be here who would know far more about Robert Brown than I do. I haven't made a lifetime study of Robert Brown. I don't pretend to have done that. Uh, and I certainly is Norwich Connections. There may be people here now who know more about that than I do. So when the questions are asked, I'll pass them on to you. And I'll be listening to your answers, because I'm interested. Now, it's essential to fit Robert Brown into his times. If you don't do that, you don't get a clue. Unless we bear in mind the culture in which he was born, the circumstances in which he grew up, you will never understand what he did here in 1580 to 1581. During the third century, that reminds me of the mayor of Casterbridge, uh, when Henshaw was in the great chair, you remember, and the old lady was being tried and she started to give her defense and she said 20 years ago it weighed and fair and the, the clerk said go back to the creation well I've gone back to Theodosius in the third century Constantine and Theodosius what happened then these two Roman emperors linked to the church and the state and they set in motion a, a, a machine a, a, an organization to form one commonwealth between the state politics and the church. And from then on, Western Europe was in the grip of this engine. The civilized world was dominated by this all encompassing organization. So that in those days, from the third or fourth century, right up through on and on and on, you weren't so much an Englishman or a Scotsman or a French or a Spaniard, you were a member of this Christendom. You got into it by sprinkling by the hand of a priest as a baby. And you went out in one of two ways. You died. Or if you had the audacity to question what was going on, you went out at the hand of a swordsman or fire or what. Of course, there were people who fought against this. The Albigenses, the Paulicans, Wardenses, Lollards. And so on and so on. Most of them, of course, we don't know anything about. History is always written by the winners. And these men are on the run. But nevertheless, down the years, there were these testimonies and these witnesses. But the vast majority of men and women, for the next thousand years, lived and died under the regime of this engine. 
the, the, the Pope became the, the, the church's head, and of course the king, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charlemagne, he forged it into one great political engine, but the battle was raging between the Pope and the king. Sometimes the Pope was top, sometimes the king was. But it made no difference. The two worked together to crush all dissent. So we come to the Reformation. Now, this engine, this all-encompassing engine, continued through the Reformation. It didn't end with the Reformation. Luther, Zwingli, Tyndale, Calvin, the English reformers, were all heavily committed to this state church idea. The magistrate enforcing religion. To jump on another 150 years or so, and you come to the Westminster Confession in the 1646, that which still stands for the majority of Presbyterian churches, is still written there. The magistrate enforces religion. Supremely the king, of course. Now, early in the 1520s, in Zurich, Ulrich Zwingli was teaching a group of young men. He had been converted... Uh, he was a Roman priest, but he had been converted. And he was teaching a group of young men. And they were questioning much of the papist teachings. And one in particular that they questioned was infant baptism. And they came to the view that it should be baptizing of believers only. But Zwingli hesitated. He wanted to do it, but he said he would wait until the city authorities, the magistrate, gave him the right but certain young men said, no, we're not waiting. And in 1525, George Blaurock, Conrad Grable, and Felix Mance, and others, met in Zurich, and they baptized as believers, one another. They were called Anabaptists, rebaptizers, that's what the Greek means. They rejected that idea. Our first baby baptism, our infant baptism, was no baptism at all, they said. This is our real baptism. They separated themselves from the state church. They put themselves outside the authorities. The authorities don't like it. For example, uh, Felix Mance was drowned in the River Limmat, tied to a hurdle in the dark, as dark was coming one afternoon. Others had suffered terrible poor punishments, terrible, indescribable. But Anabaptism spread throughout Europe, Bohemia, right throughout Europe, and it came to England. And many of the people that were burned at the stake in Mary's reign were not the great Anglican bishops, but the despised Anabaptists, the cobblers, soap boilers, the nobodies, the riffraff. They dared to question Christendom, but they were crushed. They were crushed like a nut. Reformers crushed them. Rome crushed them, and they both used the state to crush them. So the reformers and Rome can say, we don't burn anybody, <laughs> but we hand them over to the authorities, and they burn them. But burn they were. By 1550, when Robert Brown was born, the uniformity of religion was still enforced by the magistrate. There were some exceptions, not only the Anabaptists, but there were secret churches. Of course, we don't know much about these secret churches, but we know enough to know that they existed. For example, we know of two churches, one in Bocking in Essex and the other in Faversham in Kent, and these two churches had fellowship crossing the Thames. We also know of uh, the Plumbers Hall gallery, gathering. We also know something called the Privy Church under a man called Richard Fitz, and so on. And then there were the Anabaptists. And then there was a whole host of radicals spawned in secret. But by now, Elizabeth is on the throne. Now, what Elizabeth's religious spiritual condition is, uh, I leave others to say, 
But one thing that rode high above everything else, she demanded and was going to get uniformity. Uniformity at all costs. I think myself that she hedged slightly towards Rome. Maybe not slightly. But anyway, she wanted uniformity. And she crushed all dissent. By the 1570s, so Brown is now 20, 25, the Church of England is in a very troubled and unsettled condition. There's dissent within the Church of England. They know that there must be reform if ever it's going to be a proper church. And they begin to speak about it. And so the state church is under attack. It's got the Anabaptists and these secret believers outside. And it's got people within the Church of England, uh, Puritans they're called, or they will be known as Puritans, and they want the church purified. Some of them are Episcopalian, that is, they believe in bishops, but some of them are Presbyterian by this stage. But the two of them are pushing for dissent. So there's dissent from without with the Anabaptists and these others, and there's dissent from within. But Elizabeth is riding roughshod over the law. But in the 1570s, 1580s now, 1580s, another force arose, a force which would be more devastating than the Puritans inside the Church of England and more devastating than the Anabaptists outside. And that goes down to Robert Brown. What Robert Brown did in this city in 1580 to 1581 blew the thing right open. This new category, the Brownies, arose as an unexpected result of another man altogether, Thomas Cartwright. Cartwright was the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity in the University at Cambridge. And in 1569, it was a very short-lived professorship uh, because he did something which was the kiss of death. He decided, because he had come back from the continent, he was now a convinced Presbyterian, so now he is a Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity, an Anglican, you see, in the Church of England, and he's going to give his lectures. And he's going to lecture on Acts chapter 1, and he's going to push what for? Presbyterianism. Within the Church of England. He's going to speak against bishops and speak for Presbyterianism. The authorities don't say, well, that's interesting. They boot him out. He sacked. Robert Brown attended those lectures. Now, the Puritans were saying, we, we want reform, but we must wait. Wait till Elizabeth gives it to us. We want change investments. We want change in the liturgy. We want change in this and that and the other. In each generation, they moved on to something else. But always it was, as long as Elizabeth would give us the nod. But she wasn't going to give them the nod. And one of the books that Brown published, jumping ahead, in... Uh, Middleburg had this title, A Treatise of Reformation Without Tarrying for Any. A Treatise of Reformation Without Tarrying for Any. It gives you the clue. We want reformation, whether it be vestments, liturgy, or whatever you name it, but we are not waiting. We want it now. And whatever the cost, we will pay it. Cartwright, to show you the background here, Cartwright stated that heretics, you see, he is a state churchman. He's a Presbyterian, but he wants a Presbyterian state church. Cartwright boldly stated that heretics should not be pardoned, even if they repented. He went on to say, they ought to be put to death now. If this be cruel or extreme, I am counted, I am content to be counted so with the Holy Ghost. 
All that the Puritans lacked at that time was power. If they could have got their hands on the, the, the levers of power, they too would have persecuted all dissent. Cartwright went as far as this. The magistrate ought to enforce the attendance of papists and atheists on the services of the church to punish them if they do not profit by preaching, by the preaching that they might hear, to increase the punishment if they gave signs of contempt, and if at the last they proved utterly impenitent to cut them off. How the magistrates could judge whether anybody in their heart had benefited by preaching, I am absolutely staggered. I don't know how they're going to test it. You, what's the test? Brown was insisting, no. Toleration. Not the full-blown toleration that will come with John Smith and Roger Williams when the Baptists arise in the 1600s. That will have to wait a little longer. But he goes a long way in that way. But his main point is this. The state, the magistrate, the queen, the king has no right to tell me what to believe. Has no right to tell me how to practice my religion. But, of course, the separatists were to be persecuted. Let me just give you some of the views of Robert Brown. The essence, substance, and life of the church is the keeping of the covenant by outward discipline and government. Nothing can make a church except the power of Christ to separate the unworthy. He believed in church discipline, but that discipline should be in the hands of Christ, exercised by the church itself, not in the hands of the magistrate. He further declared that the magistrates have no ecclesiastical authority whatsoever at all. They may do nothing concerning the church to compel religion to plant churches by power and to force a submission by laws and penalties belongs not to them. If you know your church history, you will know that for a long time by this time, um, uh, these teachers who were on the side of the state church had abused such passages as compel them to come in. (laughs) Compel them to come in. Well, I believe we should compel them in. I should compel you to come in to Christ by my preaching, (laughs) pleading with you, arguing with you, convincing you, persuading you. Not with the sword. That belongs to Islam, not to Jesus Christ. Brown didn't have it all right. I'm not pretending. But Brown came to the view that a minister was a minister by the consent and ratifying of the church. It wasn't the magistrate with his licenses who can um, make a man a minister. And then came one of his glorious statements. And it's come down the centuries. Let them know that the Lord's true people is of the willing sort. It is the conscience and not the power of man that will drive us to seek the Lord's kingdom. However did this man, I mean I was going to say he's a young man, but I suppose at this time 30 year old, it's sort of middle aged I suppose, but 30 year old. How did this 30 year old man come to these views? Well he was born into a family of wealthy merchants near Stamford in 1550. He went to Corpus Christi at Cambridge. In 1570, he's probably drawn to that college because of his Puritan sympathies. He attended, as I've said, Cartwright's epoch-making lectures. Graduating in 1572, he became a schoolmaster for about three years, probably at Southwark, during which time he engaged in open-air preaching in the gravel pits at Eslington. 
At the outbreak of plague in 1578, he went back to his father's house. Increasing spiritual light was breaking in upon this young man all the while. And as his understanding developed, so he sought to obey what God was showing him in his word. He moved to Dry Drayton, just north, uh, just north, uh, northwest of Cambridge, about five miles. And he joined the household of a conforming Puritan minister, a man called Richard Greenham. He had recently been appointed rector in that village. Greenham is one of the most underrated Puritans. He was a godly pastor, a good preaching minister. That was his reputation. Most diligent, practical, kind, able. A very gentle man. He would rise at four each morning to preach to the farm laborers. Then he would follow them across the fields, conversing with them about spiritual matters. He aimed to deal wisely and comfortably with an affected conscience, in which aim he succeeded, for his masterpiece, it said of him, was in comforting wounded consciences. God used him as an instrument of good to many, who came to him with weeping eyes and went from him with cheerful souls. His house at Dry Drayton became a kind of Puritan academy, seminary with various Puritan ministers staying there. And they stayed there for extended visits. And they talked. They talked. Spiritual talk. When Greenham came to the end of his ministry, in 1594, he died of the plague, he felt he'd been a failure. He, he felt that he had helped only one family in the village. But as I say, he is a greatly underrated Puritan. Robert Brown came to live in his house in 1578. Now, Greenham was a loyal Anglican. He was a thoroughgoing Episcopalian. But he wanted simplicity in dress. And he lamented over the grievous state of the Church of England. And here is Brown, this young man, studying, thinking thoughts, from scripture about the nature and the governance of a church. Night and day, this is Brown, he did consult with himself and others. He was always talking. Cartwright's lectures were having their effect on this young man. Brown began to see the trouble was not the bishops because they were wicked. That was a given. But the very nature of Episcopalianism was unscriptural. Greenham argued with him because he was an Episcopalian, a bishop man. And so they would have ding-dong arguments. Brown retorted that the bishops were a miserable failure. They were not calling the people from their sins. They did not preach the word of God. Now, here is a signal fact. Greenham was so impressed with this young man that he invited him with these Puritan ministers there, some great men. He invited this young man to expound the word of God at the table after meals. And then he went even further. He did something illegal. He invited him to preach in the parish without a license. And then the next fact is remarkable. So gifted was this young boy, well, young man, so gifted was he in his preaching that the mayor and vice-chancellor of the university gave him a lectureship at Bennett Church in Cambridge for six months, still unlicensed. I mean, this is unthinkable. Now, Brown's brothers came to Cambridge to get the seals for his ministry. Uh, the necessary papers. But he refused them. To be authorized, to be sworn, to subscribe, to be ordained, and to receive their licensing, he utterly misliked and kept himself clear in these matters. Furthermore, he would take no payment for his labors. I'm not a hireling, he said. They can't buy me. I preach to satisfy duty and conscience. 
The kingdom of God, he said, is not all parishes, but rather the worthiest, be they never so few. Of course, the bishop didn't like this, and he deprived him of the lectureship. This was a very important time for young Brown. Had a lasting effect upon him. It broke his health. I mean, imagine it. He's running against a culture of society. You know, can all these men be wrong and I be right? Can, can it be? Am I the only one in step here? But he developed his arguments in this fevered atmosphere of, of this Puritan seminary. He, he was arguing. And all the time he was working out his ideas and, and trying to understand. It was all so new. He, um, it's utterly impossible for us because, I mean, we just take this for granted. We, we know we can meet here tonight. There's no policeman out there waiting to take my name or whatever else. You know. There's Richard Green. I mean, I, 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 I've got to disagree with him. There's this man from Dedham. There's this man, this Puritan. I've got to disagree with them. Is it only me who's right? I think he had, a, well, he did, what we would call today a nervous break. All the same, he distinctly felt that the Lord was leading him and trying him. Indeed, that the Lord was preparing him to a further and more effectual message. He wept over the state of the church. He was lonely. Where could he find anybody like-minded? He, he recovered his health. And he went over to Middleburg, to the Low Countries, probably in 1579 to 80. Probably, quite possibly, because he knew that Cartwright was now preaching in a church there, a Puritan congregation. And it's almost certain, though we can't prove it, that while he was in the Low Countries, I mean, it almost be inevitable, he had conversations with the Dutch Anabaptists there. So this man is moving. He starts off as an Episcopalian. Now he's a Presbyterian. Now that's wrong. Where am I going to end up? And he learned probably, I think, from the Dutch, the Anabaptists, that in Norwich, there was a massive, in, in these terms, massive, um, settlement of Dutch people. Uh, Norwich at this time had 5,000 Dutch people. A huge number for the time. I mean, we can see the Dutch influence all around us. And of course, many of these were Anabaptists. And also Norwich at this time is one of the great centres in England of Puritanism. So where else to go? Let's go back to Norwich. What is more, he has a friend living in this town, a man called Robert Harrison, who is in charge uh, uh, of a hospital here. He's the, he's the master of a charity hospital here. And, and uh, Harrison had met uh, Brown uh, when Harrison went to Cambridge um, to get his licenses, Harrison's, to preach. Uh, and Brown dissuaded him. He said, it's trash and pollution. He was a very persuasive man. So Brown came to Norwich. And he lodged here. And he began to talk to Harrison. He was a talker. And he was very persuasive. He was very dogmatic. And he convinced Harrison, in between 1580 and 1581, he convinced Harrison that we are to forsake and deny all ungodliness and wicked fellowship, and to refuse all ungodly communion with wicked persons, for God will receive none to communion and covenant with him, which are as yet one with the wicked. He's appealing for regenerate church membership. You aren't a member of the church because somebody sprinkled you. You aren't a member of the church because you live in this parish. Have you been born again? Have you got the evidence of it? There was only one thing left, one logical outcome. And accordingly, on a certain day, Harrison and Brown and a few others met together in this city. And they covenanted together 
and they agreed to form a church. And it would be a separatist church with no influence on the magistrates. And it would be comprising, comprised only of regenerate men and women. Now, this is generally known as the first separatist church. Now, that's not strictly true because the Anabaptists have been forming churches for 60-odd years. But it goes down in history as the first separatist church. He had various views about church officers. I won't read them all to you now. It was a congregational church. The church meeting. Uh, ruled the church, the decisions of the brothers and sisters together. They should submit to no outside rule. There is very strong evidence that John Milton, a hundred years later, uh, must have read Brown's works. Brown was an effective preacher. Uh, he attracted a hundred or more in congregations round and about here, in conventicles and private houses in and around Norwich. He was pumping out this congregational order all the time. He heard that some people at Bury St. Edmunds who were taking the same line, and he traveled there. And for his pains, he was imprisoned. He was the first of 32 imprisonments. He was kept in such close confinement. The cells were so dark that he could often not see his hand in front of his face. And he was locked up with the vilest of humanity. The church in Norwich, because of this persecution breaking out, were minded to flee. But Brown wrote to them from prison and said, stand, stand. But the time came when Brown himself was persuaded. And on his release, they were all fully persuaded that the Lord did call them out of England. And they went to Middleburg in 1581. I think that's further evidence that they were sympathetic to the Anabaptists. They didn't agree with them on various points, especially baptism. On first arriving in Middleburg, this separatist church joined the Puritan congregation with Cartwright, but it wasn't going to last. Uh, Brown came, and the church, the separatist church, separated from Cartwright. Brown quarreled with Cartwright. I should have said um, earlier on, for all his faults, and there are many, and they're big, I still admire this man. But there are many things about this man which are not at all savory. In fact, really, the essence of his work is almost finished now. But just to sketch it in, a violent, vehement quarrel broke out between the two men, Cartwright and Brown. And Brown almost certainly was at fault. He twisted Cartwright's arguments. The truth is, I think at this time, this is what I would say about him, the struggles he had been through the last 10 years had so tormented his mind, he was not always sane. In fact, the church, the separatist church itself, uh, grew weary of Brown. And he left that church because he quarreled with them. And he took a few families and he went to Scotland where he quarreled with John Knox. <laughs> And then the unthinkable. Let me just say that the church with Harrison survived in Middleburg until 1594 when he died and then it ceased to exist. But for all these troubles and for all his mental anguish and for all his nervous breakdowns and all the rest of it, during this time in Middleburg he published three books. He's no sluggard. <laughs> He ain't got the PC there tapping it away, has he? I mean, I've already mentioned a treatise of Reformation without tarrying for any, but there were others. As I said to you, these two men at Barry St. Edmunds, Elias uh, Thacker and John Coppin were hanged 
for reading these books. They were dynamite. And then the unthinkable. He came into England from Scotland and he changed again and he became an Anglican. <laughs> he conformed to the Church of England and he became a rector in Northamptonshire in 1591. And he settled there for 40 years. But his enemies would say about him, yes, he's conformed, but he hasn't really conformed. The truth is, my friend, I'll leave this, but the truth is, he, he was not sane. He was a broken man. But you see, the seed he had sown, without tarrying for any, that doesn't sound much to me. I didn't ask anybody's permission could I come here tonight. I don't care who's against me. There's nothing they can do. And even if they can do, King Jesus reigns. This is what Harrison said. There is one king in the church and his name is Jesus. The court. Harrison and Brown, Brown particularly, never looked for favors from the court. They wouldn't have got them, but they never looked for it. They didn't go to the magistrates. And this is so encouraging to me. They were so small. They were so fragile in their beginnings. Their feeble origins. But my friend, they broke it open. And we, all of us here, and if the place was packed, I would tell them all. We, all of us. Presbyterians, Anglicans, whoever you might be, you owe a tremendous debt to this man. I must say this. Many who should know better, separatists, have forgotten these things or suppressed them. I said I'm partisan. I am partisan. Our forefathers were hanged for daring to meet together to worship God according to his word as our conscience told them. Do you know the story of Henry Barrow, John Greenwood, John Penry? You really want to read how they hanged John Penry. You want to read his last letter to his dear wife Eleanor. If it doesn't move you to tears, I fear for you. He was taken to the hanging place and then taken back. He was taken to the hanging place and taken back again and again. But eventually he was hanged. Why? That was in the 1590s, just after Brown. Why? Because he was following this kind of teaching, the Brownists. Of course, Christianity today, I'm talking about separatist Christianity. You see, it's become sanitized. Many, many, many separatists love the trappings of state. When anything's going on, they're there in all their finery. Look at their buildings. Look at the Victorian buildings. If you know Martin Lloyd-Jones, he speaks very strongly about this. He says the Victorian age was a disastrous age. What happened was... Before the Victorian age, the separatists, the Baptists, the Congregationalists were the offscouring of society. They were the rejected, and they met in dingy back alleys. Their meeting houses were out of the way. But in the Victorian age, we had to build something on the high street, bigger and better than the Anglicans. Lloyd-Jones is very strong. This is a disastrous age. I said I'm partisan. It will offend some of you. You see, I don't like it when separatists are badgering Parliament to try and bolster Christianity. I want to bolster it by preaching the gospel. It's prayer. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. Oh, we're weak. We're small, yes. Poor old Brown in this town with Harrison. But my friend, it was an acorn... That lifted a tremendous weight. Elizabeth could not contain it. Brown and his friends died in ignominy. 
The vast majority of them are unknown today. Despised by some. Bishop Hall sneered at Brown. And even the separatists said he'd become an Anglican, so they didn't bother with him. But I tell you this, my friend, I don't know, of course, for certain, but I tell you this in my judgment, God honors him. This man speaks to me. He challenges me. He reproves me. He encourages me. And I really hope he speaks to you. He's worth looking at. He made tremendous mistakes. You can laugh at his faults. But I do admire a man who takes his Bible and whatever the Lord shows him, he will do. Though the heavens fall, he will stand for God. I believe he has his reward. And it's been a privilege tonight to say a few words. Not to honor this man, but to praise God that he raised up such a man. And I, like you, you often sing the hymn, Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take my intellect. Take my moments. Take my days. Take my sober. Take my goal. Take me. But use me in some way. However small, however feeble. The first shall be last. And the last shall be first. He was last in this life. But I think he'll stand with others right at the front of the rank. He didn't get it all right. But I bless God for the inheritance I have from such a godly man. And I want to be challenged by him. And I put him to you. Amen.